Introducing Richard Huck Planis, 8th degree master of Kenpo Karate. As a true first generation student of Ed Parker's, Huck trained at Master Parker's Pasadena School in the late 60s. And as a black belt, he managed and taught at the Pasadena School until 1975. Huck served for over 10 years as the executive vice president of the International Kenpo Karate Association until Master Parker's death. Huck Planis teaches not only the how-to, but the why, based on the rules and principles of the Kenpo system. As Master Parker said, he who knows how will be the student, he who knows why will be the instructor. Huck Planis is available for seminars internationally. For booking information and information on other RVF videos, call 1-800-356-VIDEO. Hello, I'm Richard Planis, and this tape is going to be on the beginner Kenpo forms. And let me talk about the forms here for a second. Uh, we have a saying that uh, Kenpo forms, unlike uh, most other systems forms, do not represent an imaginary fight. Kenpo forms teach what we call the rules and principles of motion, uh, that everything has a reverse and an opposite, and you're given an example of that. In fact, uh, when I ask my students, what's the definition of Kenpo forms, I like to hear them say, Kenpo forms teach the rules and principles of motion that everything has a reverse and an opposite, and you're given an example of this. See, now, uh, in the forms, we are doing two things. We are combining the upper body and the lower body together. In other words, up until this point, we've done what we call our hand isolations, where we've stood in a horse and just worked your upper body. Remember, that's the definition of a horse stance. Is a horse is your basic training stance for training the upper body only. So we just get in our horse to represent sitting in a chair, and we isolate the hands and do our hand isolations of our in, out, up, down on our blocks. And then we get away from hand isolation, and we go to a foot and leg isolation, like when we work uh, our stances, we'll just get in your stance, and your hands can be basically anywhere, because all we're doing now is the lower body of moving with our footwork, our stances, our kicks, whatever. So we've, again, isolated the lower body away from the upper. So the purpose of the forms is to combine the upper and the lower body together and make them work in unison. So, again, those and thens are gone that we talked about earlier. Is we want to what we call solidify your base the same time you solidify your block. Uh, to point this out uh, from looking is an example of improper motion is like if I did the block and then got in my stance. Or if I made sure that I was in my stance and then did my block. Again, I'm doing isolation. Or I separated the two apart. And the purpose, again, is that we want to combine that together with the proper body mechanics. Now, we point out something about pivoting. Uh, there's what we call the right way and the wrong way to pivot. Uh, and that is that you can pivot, uh, if you're looking at the feet, you can pivot off your heel or you can pivot off the ball of your foot. See, uh, we generally teach that you never pivot on the heel because it creates an and then and a float. Now, let me point out what, we're, what I'm talking about. Now, first of all, the way I teach people to drop back into a neutral bow is your basic fighting stances. I have you just like take a couple of steps forward normal, and this will put your feet at normal everyday width. And if I drop, if I want a right neutral bow, for example, if I drop my left foot just straight back and pivot on the balls of your feet, you will come out in a neutral. And it, by pivoting on the heel, you get a smooth sink and settle in one move. If I was going to pivot on the heel, I would have to alter this line to be open because I'm going to gain some ground by pivoting this in. So to get my proper alignment, I would have to open my center line more uh, to take that in consideration. But the main thing is being from the step back to have to pick up the ball of my foot. Now, you, you notice that I'm, I'm exaggerating this. It doesn't have to come up a lot, but the, the principle is still there. So I have to unload my foot, turn it, and then set it down. I say, oh, I need a little bit more here because I did that extra move. See, so This is one of the reasons that we don't like to pivot on our heel. Is it causes the base float and then settle in instead of the step, twist, and settle in one move. Okay, so. Well, most of the time when we move, this is what we're looking for. So from here, we'll take it right into the forms. 
Okay, the first form that we do in most schools is what we call short form one. And this again is just doing the four basic blocks of the standard inward, outward, upward, and downward, what we say is first facing the four walls. As if you'll notice the lines in the tape uh, make the cross and these point basically at the four walls, which is the same as these lines. And then we have the corner lines, which we call the corner lines, or they point in the corners. But we start off as a beginner just working on the four walls. Now every form has a name and a definition. So short one, we say, what is it? It's retreating with a front hand block. So that is what you're doing. That's the only thing you're doing is retreating with a front hand block. We're also what we call walking your stance. And in this case, it's the neutral bow, the easiest stance to walk. In other words, every time we move, we're either moving into or out of a neutral bow. Again, as the easiest stance to move from. And we also pick up both uh, methods of execution on uh, your inward block here as we have the hammering and the thrusting based on point of origin, and that happens through the forms. So uh, I'm going to be moving a lot uh, to just point out uh, the, where you're at in relationship to the cross and the alignment we're looking for. Uh, but again, there are no, should be no extra steps in the form. Now I'm going to give you some examples of extra steps. Extra steps are just that. They're steps that you do not need or shouldn't do based on proper timing. Okay, like starting off from a horse. If I was going to move back, if I went, I'm forgetting the hands, but just went like one, two. That's two steps to get me back that should have been one. Then I'm going to make an angle change. I'll go one, two again and have an extra step in each case of having two moves to get me to position instead of one is that's not the principle. Remember, the principle is the economy of motion, get it done in one job. Now, we'll start again uh, when we move. I'm going to move quite a few times probably just to point out the relationship of where the, the feet belong. Uh, not Sometimes you'll see an extra step just to get me to pattern, but remember they don't belong there. There should be nine moves only. Uh, like standing in a horse, I don't want to go I'll take a bunch of steps to get me here. So if I was going to center, I would have one step, and the rule is cast off the weak, so the left foot is the one that leaves and drops you into your horse. Okay, and then we, our start position is here. This is called a training horse, and this is called your formal horse. All your forms and sets and classes start and end from here. Okay, so this is the position, and this basically represents hands-up position, like we talked earlier, of hands-up, so you don't have to do the surprise block of the hand-down of the thrusting inward. So if we were talking, you'd say, hey, what's the problem here? Remember, the hand is up, ready to use, instead of being down or behind. What's the problem? And then have to move with the extra motion from being in a surprise situation. So again, when we start, we, we move back and we go settle into the block and the stance at the same time. And then when we move again, I want to point out something else is what we call a twist through as opposed to a step through. Now, uh, back in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, we realized that uh, the twist through was not included in our basics. Uh, and it's in the forms, though, and a lot of people do it by mistake of not understanding the difference. Okay, and this, uh, now's a good time to point this out. Uh, Rick, would you hand me a stick over there, please? <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the difference between a step through and a twist through uh, is just timing. The end result is the same. Now, hear me being online in a left neutral bow facing the camera, which is 12 o'clock. Your center line should point at 130, 45 degrees out. If I was to do a step through either forward or backwards, now, first of all, the definition of step through is changing sides facing your opponent by either losing or gaining distance. So if I come forward, I'm going to gain distance. If I step in reverse, I'm going to lose distance. But coming forward so you can see this, when I move, the center line starts moving right away. So when my foot gets there, the center line also gets there. So it happens at the same time, either in forward or reverse. In a twist through, you get either the distance and then the rotation, or the rotation, and then the distance. So example, I would say, move forward, keep this line, 
get the distance, and then pick up the rotation. See? Get the distance, and then the rotation. Or you can get the rotation, and then the distance. See, so everything has a reverse and an opposite. Well, this is a, a common mistake that I see a lot of beginners do uh, when they do short one is they do tw basically twist throughs. In other words, they'll get the first position and then get the distance and then the rotation. And that's a broken timing. Again, that goes back to like isolation. You isolate the two parts from each other. So we want to watch our twist throughs here. Again, those, if you know the forms, those are found in the twos when we pick up the twist throughs and bring in that timing. So right now we want one, not two. So when we move, we're going to start centered. Now remember, I would not be on line. If you're looking at the lines, I would not be on line. This line, to, I would have to be here. So when I cut the angle and move, I would wind up on my heel and toe line. Again, these lines are just references. But a lot of times I'm going to adjust to show you with the alignment, especially in the angle changes. So we had our first hand move. Remember, the hands were here. That represents hands up. So when you move, you have the hammering inward. Then the second move comes from what we call a, a false, unrealistic position, which is cocked on your side. See, we started in our training horse, we started here. And this just says, this is a place to put it, like the gun in the holster, while we look and study one thing. And put that in the holster while we study the other hand. Our hands in Kenpo are generally never here. They're always in a realistic fighting position. But because we're doing single moves, we look at it as a single move, and we chamber or put the other one in the holster, cocked. See? So when we moved again to get the center line correct, we move back and cut the line. Now also, talking about footwork, is everybody should be familiar with the what we call the V-step or the L-step. Now, V-stepping or L-stepping is when we do this type of motion. They close and use it for changing directions many times. There's a rule or principle that that follows, and we say we never V-step to move away from a person, but we always V-step to move into a person. The reason being we close our center line and we pick our line of entry. So where do I want to be? So the reason for this is if I move, like just working from the front, you have to imagine yourself as an, as an opponent, or the camera as an opponent. If I'm standing here and a person moves on me, if I bring my feet together before I step back, I haven't done anything with the target. The, the target position and depth has not changed. So that's my first move, and then my second move is going to move me away. See, so if I cut the angle and just cut straight on an angle, I lose ground the same time the foot moves. So that's why we do this, is we don't V-step to move away because we don't move the target. And while I'm on that subject, I see a lot of people splitting their stance. Now, this is for sideways, where you can see the lines on the floor, hopefully. Splitting is just like you divide a candy bar. Say, I'm going to get into a stance by splitting. I'll give half to the left foot and half to the right foot. And my nose is still exactly in the same spot. See, so this is the reason that we say we never split our stance, because you don't change your opponent's focus point. Now, yeah, example of this, let me use Rick on this. Rick, come in. If we're in an argument and he decides that he's had enough of me or whatever, and he's going to step in to punch me in the nose. He says, wait a minute, Rick. He says, hmm, where do I have to step to take this guy's head off? See, so he looks at the floor and he says, okay, where do you have to step, Rick? Right there. And then when you hit, you've got a good focus and penetration, enough travel through to hit. So he, he, he saw where he had to step. You catch on? See, now, if you go back where you were, if I, he's, he's going to initiate the motion, he knows where he wants to step. So... If I split my stance, I have not altered this at all, you see. I did not change my opponent's focus point. Where he had to step to hit me is still exactly where he had to step to hit me at the target he was looking for. So this is another principle that we use is never split your stance because we want to change the opponent's focus point. We'll either off angle or move back or move forward to change this, but we don't want to stay where we're at. There's a lot of different principles, like I say, involved in the system.
And a lot of times when we do something like this, when we're on a subject, I like to point these out. Now, what we're doing again is we're doing our two in the short one, two inwards, two outwards, two upwards, and two downwards. There's another principle in our forms that when we do our upwards, they're always behind us. And this is just a tool to help you remember and not get lost as a beginner where you are. I remember, you know, the first time I saw short one, the nine moves, and I says, my God, how does anybody remember that? See, and then they told me that the next form, long one, has 60 moves in, and I said, oh, no way. See, but really, you're just doing the same thing, and if you learn it by your roadmap and your principles, uh, it's a way of not getting lost. So you say, you do your inwards and outwards, and then you say, well, okay, what's next? Upwards. Okay, that's behind me. You know that. So again, it's a tool to remember where you're at. Uh, we just to be different, uh, like if, if you study other systems or are familiar with other systems, you'll notice that most other systems, when they cover, meaning turn around to go the opposite direction, that they do it with a downward block, and we just be different and do it with an upward block. But actually, we do it with, with all blocks. As you, if you've learned all the forms, you'll see that. Now, again, when we move away, we're settling with your stance and your block, and we don't want our twist through, so when we start moving, we're actually using a cat through or a cat transition, and we move the second block comes from your hip up, and there's where you pick up the thrusting. So you have both the high hand says hammer, the low hand says thrust. So you picked up the two inward blocks to 12 o'clock on that line. Then we have our first angle change. Now, I'm moving up to the intersection here where you can see this. My toe is in the intersection. My back heel is on the line for my alignment. When we step here, I'm going to change to the wall. So again, I don't want to V-step and have an extra move. So I'm just going to say, where's the foot point? It's pointing in that direction in the first place. So it just steps over to the line with my heel on the line. And then when I pivot both feet on the balls at the same time, I'll pick up my new angle of 90 degree angle change facing 9 o'clock. Now here's where our minor major comes in that when we move, the hand that's up is going to become the next block. So, you say, well, if I just left the hand in that position and I stepped over here, the block's already up. I say, yes, but it doesn't have any travel for power. Travel is the distance a weapon moves to a target, so I need to wind up for the pitch, just like throwing a ball. I've got to wind up for the pitch. So I'm going to drop this hand and set up my circle to give it its travel and momentum to come into my block. Here's where our minor major rule comes in, or what we call 180 degree hands. Everything is based on the 180 degrees, or the 6 and 12, that this hand is making a circle, and if this hand is making a circle, it doesn't matter how you do it, if this hand is at 12 o'clock, this hand is always at 6 o'clock. Then we have your 3 and 9s, your 3 and 9, 6 and 12, whatever you do, they're 180 degrees, or this principle out from each other. This line is the same as the horizontal line, as one is always cocked and one is always uh, striking, cocking and striking at the same time, this way now. So when this hand drops, I have to fill that void with my minor. And the way I explain this a lot of times is you're at a picnic and the bee, eating a sandwich maybe, and the bee comes to your ear. You go, get away, get away. And that's all you're doing is you're brushing the bee as we move over and then the solidify comes in with the block. And again, the stance, both minor major happen at the same time. So when you move, this settles as one move. Okay. Now from there again, we're going to step through and work the opposite side. Now, here's where our cover comes in. Now, uh, I'm going to be facing this way. So again, we pick it up on camera. Uh, really, my back would be to you. From the last outward, I'm going to, here's our neutral line. Well, I'm going to have to transpose this line and imagine another line. So I'm going to back up. And now remember, this, this line is on my front toe to my back heel. When I cover, I know that my back foot is going to become my front foot, and that has to be my toe line. So when we cover, I'm going to move my front foot over again and put my heel on that line. So when I pivot, I now pick up my toe line to my heel line facing the opposite direction. Okay, so you have to make that step over what we call add the cover angle. Again, if it's going to cover again, I would say add the cover angle and pivot 
and you come out heel toe. To do it again, add the cover angle and pivot, and you'll notice that I'm walking toward the camera, uh, and this is what you would do to catch that angle. Now, after, back to first position, so when I moved, when I stepped over, I'm going to pivot, and you notice that my last outward is already in position, so when I turn, there's my minor inward, and then the upward comes outside of it. Then to move away with my step through, which really I'm using the cat position, remember, becomes the inward and the upward happens. Now, here this will show up on camera from here, moving back to the intersection, so I have to go back to face 12 o'clock. So now my left foot steps to the line to put the heel on the line, and when you pivot, you pick 12 o'clock up again, and this is with your first downward. Now back to the transition, when the upward was up, here's where we get into uh, the difference between application and alternation rule uh, I might have talked about earlier. If not, it'll come later on. Is uh, In alternation, if I just used my right hand, the next move has to be my left. But now we're applying the principles and the rules. So my right hand is the one that's cocked. It has the travel for the downward block but I'm still going to put in my minor. So when I step over, the left hand becomes the minor inside downward palm up to give me my opposing force, rip the rag principle to do my downward block. Then this turns in my second one to become my inside downward as we move away and settle with. And then as your last position to step up to the, the close. Now, around to the close rather. Now, that's another, so I'm going to point this out what we call the last step. Uh, your brain, is most people, especially beginners, do this a little bit wrong or off, is your brain says, oh, I'm done with the form. This is my last step. And you lose your stance from here. Now, what I mean, you can see this on my back foot. When I did my first, my first downward. I'm both feet point in the corner where they belong. And I know that I have one, one move left to go. So, when I move, you wind up like, I'm exaggerating this. See, this foot is already half to the closed position because your brain's telling you you're done with the form. So you have a bad stance in the last move. Then when you come around to close, it moves very little. Okay, that's something that you should try to avoid is in the last move, you want to keep moving just like there's much more to the form. And don't let your brain tell you, oh, you're done really a step early or a move or a stance early. See, so when you move into the last position, you're still going to have your feet, let me get to the angle here, your feet are pointing at 7.30. Don't let this foot creep around and be half done, what we call half done already. And then from the block, you let, again, you don't want an extra step. You don't want to go one, two. That's a common, very common to see. So you let the leg that's going to move, which is the left leg, start to cut the angle, and it will pull in both feet to square, and it becomes and settles solid as one move. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do is work in all these angle changes with no extra moves and solidify your base with the block. And that's the, again, the principle that you're learning in long one. Excuse me, short one, not long one. Long one is the next form. And all we do is we take, in our series of beginner forms, we take this in, out, up, down principle and just add to it and change it in all the different combinations and possible ways to do it. Now what we've done here, remember the definition of this form is short one is retreating with a front hand block walking your neutral bow. And that's all we've done up to this point. So this will wrap up short form one. Okay now the next form we're going to do is long one but we're going to go back and review a little bit here on short one because I used the pattern and did a lot of adjusting to show you what we're looking for and what we're trying to accomplish. Remember, we're only looking for nine moves. And when you count, I want you to think nine moves. So and feel and look for those extra steps. So when we move, we're starting off. We sit in our horse and we go one, and two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine back to where we started from. So let's try to stick with nine moves. Okay, now. Let's get right into long one.
Again, we go with our in, out, up, down principle. But we're going to do something different. So we say, okay, what have we done so far? Short one, I've retreated with a front hand block. Now, uh, before I do this, this reminded me that most schools, when we do short one, we do both sides, right and left side. I tell people all the time, back in the 60s, we didn't make people do both sides of the forms because they're built in. A lot of people don't realize that the second half of long one is the left side of short one, plus adding to it the new material. And I'm going to point that out when we get to that point. But now to continue uh, into long one, we're still going to do, all we're going to do when we do long one is we're going to repeat short one, but we're going to add to it. So again, we say we retreated with a front hand block. What can I do now different? Well, let's add a counter. So we're going to counter with the rear hand and use a punch. Now, when we do, we learn the stance change that comes in and the reasoning why we do it. We have already should know, basically, that you learn before we get to the forms in your isolations that when you use the front hand by itself, we basically stay neutral. When you bring the rear hand in by itself, you should use a forward bow. And that's the single rule, front hand neutral, rear hand forward. So you're going to find that in the forms, when we use both hands at the same time, you can be either way and you will be either way. You're going to find in the forms that sometimes you'll be using both hands together in a neutral and sometimes you'll be using both hands together in a forward. The rule of front hand neutral, rear hand forward is when they're used singly. And that's what we're doing now is in our progression of building, we're in our single moves. Now, the problem we run in here too, or along with the, that is the footwork is, when we did short one, we walked our stance again, which was the neutral bow, the easiest stance to walk. Now you'll notice in the first half of long one that every time you move now, you have to move from a forward bow, which is much harder, and you learn the body mechanics and the weight shifting that comes into play when this happens. And that's why, if you've thought about it or seen it or know it, that long one has an extra stance, not a transition, but a stance. Remember, a stance is a frozen transition. It has an extra stance in the beginning to show you what you should be doing as far as shifting your weight to make you move correctly and keep your feet uh, in the position they belong in. Is what we don't want to do in, in the form from our forward bow is break our back ankle. Now, breaking your heel or breaking your, really we call it breaking your heel if you can just look at my back foot from a forward. Uh, if my heel comes off the ground and I break it, see, this is what we're not trying to do because uh, I'm going to exaggerate this again. It's from your punch. To break the heel, you actually have to go forward, see, and then you just put it back on the ground where it came from before you start backwards. So it puts what we call like a stutter step or a waver in your stance. I see some uh, people do the form. They're so wide when they punch that before they can move into the next move, they even drag the back foot up and then step through and get that extra step in there. Remember, this was all the stuff we're trying to eliminate is those extra moves. Okay, now, I'm going to do this uh, from the side so we can see what we're doing. That when we moved in, and you got, let me get on the alignment here for the, for the form. When we get into our neutral bow with our front hand block, then we say, okay, that's short one. Now I'm going to add the rear hand as a punch. So the punch comes in, and your foot, back foot should turn in 100% form or pure form. The foot punt points to where the punch goes. In actual application, you can lean or you can shift the foot a little bit and pick up the bracing angles, but for the form, the foot should turn and point to where the punch comes in. Now, remember, I don't want to break my heel. So breaking the heel only comes from throwing your weight forward see, and leaning. So. To keep that from happening, I teach people, I say, imagine there's a spike in your heel or a nail, and you're trying to drive it into the ground. So when you move, it's, it's already in there, but you drop back, and you it's really stick it in the ground. You say, get that heel, plant it solid in the ground. And that's our principle we're working. So when we move, I throw that weight back, and now my head can come out of there instead of break and go forward. So from the position, I can shift back, I throw my weight back into my transitional cat stance with my extra block. 
and this is an extra move, and it just gets me to my position. And said, okay, and we stance and we freeze it, and we say, like, look, Ma, every time you see me move, you're basically looking for this position. This is what keeps my heel down and lets me gain or lose that distance from my opponent to correctly without that jog forward or wave or forward before you move back. And then you continue stepping back. Now it becomes standard and you don't see that stance anymore, but you see the transition. The transition is always there of using the cat. So we say block punch, cat block as the extra move, and then block punch. And then from there it remains strictly uh, short one with the punch added. So I'll take it up to that point and when we get to the upward, I'm going to talk about the hand isolation or the extra move in there. Now, when we moved back, we went inward, forward bow and punch. Cat block with the extra move, inward, bow and punch. Now we have our same short one position that I do my minor major to my outward. My hand now is already halfway there, so now the B is very close. So when I move over, the outward comes and the bow and the punch. And the step through to the minor major and the bow and the punch. Now I'm going to turn around for the camera and set my angles again. Here's where you would be, is heel and toe facing in this direction, which would be this direction. Now, I'm in a different position than short one was, so I also have an extra move in here. And again, I'm going to add my cover angle, so I'm going to move over, transpose my line over, and say, remember that my back foot is going to be the new line, so I, again, have to add the cover angle and pivot to face the opposite direction. But there's an extra move in here, and that's the, uh, the step with the elbow. So from the punch, when we add the cover angle, we do a back or outward elbow here. It's really an outward from the alignment. Okay, but you can think it back because the man is behind you. But there's really no application here. All we're, this is what we call your introduction to reverse motion. So we, we switch. Okay. This is a punch. It got here as a punch. Reverse it. It's an elbow. So punch, elbow, punch, elbow. So this is your first reversed move. And remember, all forms also, besides having their, their theme or their track that they're trying to get across, generally has what we call previews of coming attractions or things that you're going to see in the next form or something that's going to happen later. And they're done in isolation or introduced in the form. So here it's introduced in the form that when we step, we step with the elbow. Then I'm going to do my upward block from here, but my hand is not in position to do an upward. If I just did the upward from here, I wouldn't have any power or body mechanics in it. So I, what I have to say is I have to put it in alignment. So I'm going to do a vertical move. I have to set my hand to vertical. See, so when I do that, I did the step in the elbow. I just drop the elbow. Now it's ready to do my upward. So when I pivot to my neutral and shift my feet, the upward happens. See, so we had a major stance change or foot maneuver with a major hand maneuver. So again, your timing on that should be step with the elbow, set, and then neutral, the upward, and then the forward comes in with the punch. Now from here, it's the same thing. You step through using your cat transition to do your upward, and then your punch comes in. Now here is the third difference in the form, is in the first downward block. In the ones and the twos, if you've analyzed them and looked at what you're doing, there's a difference in short one and long one and short two and long two. And the difference is always in the first downward block. How you get to the direction. The direction is the same for the time on the clock, but how you get there is different. So now, to point this out, in your first downward, here's your last upward and short one. Okay, I'm going to cover six o'clock with my first downward. Well, how am I going to do it? I'm going to move away from the man. I'm going to move away and face 6 o'clock. So now I'm going to change this and move in. Now, why? Okay. What we say is about the, the ones, short one and long one. They're what we call the retreating forms. They're the get away from the guy. Beginner's forms. The reason is a beginner does not know much. He doesn't have much ammunition. So we say when in doubt, back up.
So everything a beginner basically learns is backing up. When you have enough ammunition and know what to do, then we say, okay, now you can get in there and do what you want to do. But we say only the ones retreat, from then on we're going to advance. But remember, we made the statement earlier that all forms have previews of coming attractions. So here we have this one move in the form that says, okay, now let's move in. And we bring in the V-step principle of repeating the first move that we did to show that that represents the intersection and from there you can change directions. Remember when we started the form we went block punch and we went cat and said now let's keep moving back on the same line and now we're saying okay you're at the same position let's use it to change directions. Then you can do that different ways by moving away or moving in. See, So you're just coming to the intersection and saying which way can I go from here. So we went straight in the first move, now we're repeating it to change direction and move in and bring in that principle of the V-step and close your center line and pick your line of entry. So that's the differences in short one and long one. And remember the twos reverse that. In short one, you move away. In long one, you move in. So when we get to the twos, it's going to be reversed. And short two is going to be in. And long two is going to be away. Only in the first downward block. The, any downward after that becomes standard move away. Okay, now, so we're in our last position from the last upward in our punch. So we came to our V, our cat, and then we moved in. Now let me adjust for the line. See, with our first downward. And then we move away, it's the same thing, and we settle with our downward. So now we say, I have completed in, out, up, down for the second time. First time was in short one. Now I've done in, out, up, down again, but I've added a new move, which is bringing in the rear hand as a punch. I brought in a new stance, which was the forward bow, and showed us the proper weight transition and transfer, how to move in that. So that's the first half of the form. Now comes the second half. We're going to repeat in, out, up, down for the third time. But we're going to change something. So what can we do now that's different? Well, we say, okay, I've retreated with a front hand block. Then I retreated with a front hand block and added a rear hand counter, which was a punch. Uh, I haven't blocked with my rear hand yet. So we say, we make a statement, don't forget, you can block with your rear hand. But then there's a body mechanic that also comes into that. Then the first half of the form, when we moved and we used the rear hand, we went to the forward bow for the reach and the bracing angle. Now, while I'm on that, I want to talk about the forward bow here a little bit to show you something. A neutral bow, our front hand has X amount of reach. And, and people think you get a lot more reach when you use a forward bow with a rear hand. But what the forward bow does is it just gives your rear hand the same reach as your front hand. So if I have my proper alignment here, heel and toe, feet 45, shoulders 45. If I just extend my hands, we'll see that our back hand, basically fingers, come even with your front hand's wrist. Then if I go forward bow, both hands will become even. I'll have equal reach with both hands and then drop back to my neutral. I'll lose that one hand reach. See, so all the forward does is give your rear hand the same reach as your front hand, not any extra reach. Okay, now, we use that forward bow again in the first half because we were concerned with reach and bracing angle because we are striking. We need that, okay? When we're going to block with the rear hand, we're not concerned with reach because whatever is, we're blocking is coming to you. If there was no reason to block it, you wouldn't be hit. Or if you, you understand? So we don't need the alignment of the lower body and the bracing angle. We just need to align the hand to cross to the proper angles for blocking. So in the second half of long one, we use the forward bow position from the upper body only, or what we call it waist rotation. So when you set your base in neutral, and you're 45, then you turn square, 45. 45, square, 45. Only rotating from the waist. Your foot should not move in the second half. See, we're not concerned with reach. It's coming to us, so we just need the proper alignment. Now, what I said earlier is the second half of long one is the left side of short one. See, that's why we didn't used to make people do this. And I'm going to show you the, the purpose of blocking 
with the rear hand. So the only reason we do the second half is for the sole purpose of bringing in the rear hand. So I'm going to have Rick come back out here, and I'm going to have him do the left side of short one so we can see the differences. He can be on this side. Okay, go... Uh, uh, just go left neutral. Okay, now, what this represents is first position of the left side of neutral, which is the same position that I was in when I did my last bow and punch. Okay, now, I'm going to say, let's repeat in, out, up, down. So, let's go back to start. So we go back to the first move, which is the left side of short one. Then I'm going to say, okay, let's turn and block with the rear hand and go back to start. Then we say, second set of moves, going through Rick, that he blocks. Then I say, here's the new move, which is the rear hand, and back to start. Then we go outward. Okay. Here's short one. The new move is the rear hand. Back to start and move. Okay. Here's short one. The new move is the rear hand. Back to start. Cover with upwards. So this is short one. Here's the new move. Back to start. This is short one. Here's the new move. Back to start. Then we move away. This is short one. Here's the new move. Back to start. And this is short one. Here's the new move. Back to start. And that completes the in, out, up, down. The close is different as we don't spin around. We're already facing the angle. See, is this what I mean is the second half is the left side of short one. And the sole purpose for doing it is to just point out the block with the rear hand and not using the lower because it's not needed. Now also, there's more to that, uh, is the two different power principles like we have torque and in torque, we have what we call direct and counter rotation. And you're going to find that inward blocks can only be done with direct rotation. A direct rotation means when you're striking and turning in the same direction. Uh, example is like if I'm going to hit to my left over here, like at my hand, I'm going to turn to my left, and my hit to my left is moving in the same direction. So I'm rotating directly in the same direction that this is going. If Counter rotation is okay. I'm going to back knuckle over here and I'm going to rotate to my left wow, and strike to my right. So my rotation is turning me away from the strike. That's what we call counter rotation. Uh, when we do short one, we pick up two counter rotations. Okay. okay. Now we turn that around in the other form. Now uh, you can spend a lot of time with this, and I really don't want to do that. I don't want to keep moving, but I do want to point this out so you understand the direct and the counter rotation. Again, in short one, when we move, we go inward is direct, and inward is direct. This outward, I'm turning to my left, so I have direct. But now on the second outward, the right outward, I'm going to turn to my left, but I'm going to strike to my right. So that's our first counter rotation. Then I cover, and we're going to find that the rotation does not apply in the vertical lines. Now I'm going to face the camera here for the last set of moves. When I move the first downward, I'm going to turn to my right and strike to my right. So that's direct rotation. Then in the last move, I'm going to rotate to my left, but I'm going to strike to my, excuse me, I'm going to rotate to my right, but strike to my left. So that's what I mean, but there's two counter rotations in there. Okay, it's the right outward and the left downward. So those were the only two that were direct uh, counters. All the rest were direct. Everything having a reverse and an opposite. That means now when I do long one in the second half, and it is short one, remember, I'm going to reverse that process and make everything that was direct counter and everything that was counter direct. And you have to play with that and understand uh, to catch on to that. Now, that gets us through the standard in, out, up, down blocks. Now, we get to what we call the hand isolation portion of the form. Is This is really our first isolation, and isolations are what we call food for thought, previews of coming attractions, things to look for, to see if they're there, to see if they're not there. If they're not, where are they? So you finished the last downward block. So again, I'm going to go to position here where you just went one 
two, three. Now that was the last standard downward block. Then we step into our horse, and that is your one of the keys for what is a hand isolation. Anytime we stand in a horse and just move your hands, that is an isolation. In other words, we're, we're out of a fighting stance or fighting position. So this says, hey, look at what you're doing, think about why and how come we're doing it. So in the end, on the line, now, this would be the alignment, but really I would be stepping up to square. So on the last downward block, I say, okay, that's the standard downward blocks, but there's a lot of other things that we use too. And here are some other things that we do. So when I step up into my horse, I'm going to do this in conjunction with a different block now, and that's the inside downward palm down. Okay, so when I moved, I went, when I hit my horse, I make the inside downward palm down, and we do these in sets of three also. We go one, two, three. Now, a common mistake in this part of the form is people want to flail and move their hands just like this, where nothing is ever cocked, then moving like this. Okay, one hand is always cocked and one hand is being used. So when we stepped up, the last hand chambers and goes to cock position as this happens. Then I get ready to make my next move and then when it happens, the other hand cocks and vice versa. Okay, now let me talk about this block a second. Show you how this is like a little hidden move that a lot of people don't catch on to. Remember what we're doing in the form is blocking and countering with a punch. So when we did our in our outwards, we went to block, and then we countered with our punch. And then from this position, we said, okay, here's the punch. Let's reverse it and pick up the elbow. So we had a reversed strike. And we say, now, we must have a reversed block, too, right here. So we do it with another hand that hides it. See, so we showed you the elbow with the same hand. See, now we're going to show you the reverse block, but use a different hand, and most people don't catch on to it. In other words, if I went here and forget I have a left hand, if I went to my right downward and said, okay, now, let's reverse it. And, oh, I see, an inside downward palm down is just the reverse of an outside downward. See, so you have the reverse to block, too. But because you use a, a different hand, it hides that from you. See? So that's what we're doing when we step up. We say, okay, let's don't forget, we have the inside downward palm down that we use. Then we have one called inside downward palm up, but that requires a high cock position. Your hand has to be high and up for that. So we chamber our hand by our ear now, and we go into the one and the cock, two and the cock, three. And then we go into push downs, and we say, now, our solar plexus is our guideline here for push downs. Uh, it's like the cat, it's only the travel that we need, maximum travel to get the job done, or minimum travel. So I don't have to bring my hand over my head to get a lot of travel. If I just come to my solar plexus, I should have enough travel to get the job done. So from here, we come to the solar plexus, and we go one, two, three. And that completes the series of new blocks. And then we go into a series of punches. And again, uh, used to think why, but I'm going to point this out to you here, that we throw in two punches to the front. And I ask people, I say, have you been there? I say, yes, that's the first two punches in the form were to 12 o'clock. Then we say, now let's punch the corner. Have you been there? No. Let's punch the corner. Now the corner's being 10.30 and 1.30. So have you been there? I say, no. Then we go to 9 o'clock. Have you been there? Yes. That was the outward. And 3 o'clock, yes, you've been there. So all we're doing this for is establishing an angle. We don't say, don't forget, between the walls, don't forget there's the corners. So we're just pointing this move, and again, the new move is the corner, and that's all you're doing here is establishing a new set of angles that you will pick up in the next forms. So after that, angles, we go to our last two punches, which are the uppercuts. And again, when we did our push down, our first push down, we went from the solar plexus down. So we started from the top down, and now we're going to start from the bottom up. When we do an uppercut, we're going to say, now when we do an uppercut, don't come up any higher than your solar plexus. A lot of people, I see people do this over their head even. See, so the solar plexus is the guiding line on the last two sets of moves from the push down, solar plexus to down, and bottom 
up to that line. So we're going to go one, two, and because the right hand is cocked, it gets the third punch, and we close, and then bow. Okay, and that uh, brings in the hand isolation. Now let's go back, like uh, short one, and put the whole thing in application to look at the timing and the mechanics. So again, we're standing normal, we drop off in the horse, and we're going. We'll block, bow and punch, cat block, neutral block, bow and punch, block, bow and punch, block, bow and punch, step with the elbow, set, neutral upward, bow and punch, move, upward, bow and punch, V in, minor major, bow and punch, move away, downward, bow and punch. Now from here, your back would be to the camera, so I'm going to turn around to set the second half. And the, this ends the first half. So now we say, let's do that left side of short one. So back to neutral. Short one, new move, back to start. 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 Cover, short one, new move, back to start. Short one, new move, back to start. Okay, now on the downward, I'm going to move again away because it's not the first downward. So I'll move away. Downward, short, back to start. Downward, short, back to start. Now, I would be here, and this is where the ending comes up. Step into the horse, the new moves, inside downward, palm down, one, two, three. Palm up requires the high arc position. One, two, three. Push down from the solar plexus. One, two, three. And then our punches. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. And close. People ask on this, should I look and turn where I'm punching? So it doesn't matter. Remember, you're in a horse doing an isolation. All you're doing is establishing angles. So you're saying, don't forget. We're just saying, we've been here, here, and these are our new angles. So all you need to do is just establish those lines and then close it out. Okay, now that shows the form, and I did a lot of adjusting to show uh, for the camera what I was doing. But sometimes this can get confusing, so I'm going to do the form again, and my back is going to be to the camera but I'm going to show it, you know, again, the way it should be done. I'll be caught naming the block, though, so we'll still see or be able to hear what's going on if it is hidden by the camera. So we'll start again. We're already in our horse. So we go inward, punch, inward, inward, punch, outward, punch, outward, punch. Step and elbow, set, upward, punch, upward, punch, V in, downward, punch, downward punch, second half, inward, 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 outward, 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 upward, 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 downward, 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 isolation, inside downward, palm down, inside downward, palm up, and then we go into the push down, one, Two, three, add the punches. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, and close. And that's long one.